It's a pleasure to continue in our series of talks which are not for the final exam. <laughs> and I'm very happy to introduce Juan Malvasena, who is at the Institute for Advanced Study. He'll talk about high energy scattering and strong coupling via ADS CFT. Okay, thanks for the invitation um, to speak here. This, this talk will be a little bit more like a seminar rather than a lecture of the school. So, um, you've seen that, uh, well, it's known for a long time that gauge theories uh, for large n and fixed lambda um, should uh, be described by some kind of uh, free string theory. So if you take the n going to infinity limit, you get a free string theory. If you take finite n but large, you get an interacting string theory. In Toft's original paper, he was trying to take lambda also to be large, but we learned in recent years that we could do this even if lambda is fixed, but not, not large. Um, now, of course, uh, there is a great deal of experimental evidence for strings in QCD, and this is just uh, one of the uh, many evidences for the confining string. This is the spectrum of uh, mesons as a function of angular momentum, and so we look for the meson which has the lowest mass and highest angular momentum, and we see uh, this uh, all these particles lining up in a linear uh, plot here in a linear trajectory and this is what uh, what a model based on a string that is rotating a relativistic string that is rotating would give you now uh, would be wonderful to find the, the string theory that describes QCD uh, especially it describes this low energy limit of QCD or large and limit or the large and limit of QCD now, we don't know that string theory yet, but we do, know, we do know the string theory that describes n equal to 4 super young mills theory. So, n equal to 4 super young mills theory is a supersymmetric version of uh, young mills theory. It's the version that has the largest amount of supersymmetry, but still is a field theory. It's a theory essentially completely determined by the symmetries except for the coupling constant. And that theory is uh, related to strings on ADS5 cross S5. Um, ADS5 is a space uh, whose metric we can write in this way. It's the simplest negatively curved uh, space time. Um, so we have the four directions on which the gauge theory is defined, and we have one extra uh, dimension. And the radius of uh, ADS5 or DS5 is related to the Toft coupling. Uh, through this formula, so the radius in string units is very large when lambda is very large and very small when lambda is very small. So um, when the gauge theory is strongly coupled, that is when lambda is large, the radius in string units is large, and here uh, we have a string theory on a space with small curvature, and those uh, string theories are easier to analyze because many times we can just simply use uh, the gravity equations to describe such a string theory. We can approximate the full equations of string theory by equations in gravity. Now, the most important thing to understand uh, in ADS or to understand about this correspondence uh, is the interpretation and the physical meaning of this extra uh, dimension. So we have the four dimensions of the gauge theory, so uh, those are the four dimensions we expected, time and the three spatial dimensions. And in addition, we have an extra dimension. Now, if we have the same object in the extra dimension uh, sitting at different positions in the extra dimension, that corresponds to um, the same object in the field theory, but with different sizes. So we have a conformal field theory on the boundary, and when we have an excitation, um, it can have any size, and given an excitation of a given size, there is a related excitation we can find by doing a scale transformation. So doing a scale transformation here in the boundary corresponds to motion here in the extra dimension. So things that are very small in the gauge theory are associated to things that are very close to the boundary. Things that are very large are things far from the boundary. Now, in the previous transparency, we saw that metric. So we saw this metric in ADS. And this has this factor, 1 over c squared, uh, that multiplies all the spatial directions. In particular, for example, multiplies the time direction. And you know that the factor that multiplies the time direction is the gravitational potential. So 
uh, the, in order to understand the physics in ideas, uh, we need to remember that there is a gravitational potential. So this is just this 1 over c squared that we just mentioned. Um, so the boundary is here at c equal to 0, where the gravitational potential becomes infinite. And if you have an object here, let's, for example, this string, it will be pushed by the gravitational potential to the region uh, where the gravitational potential becomes smaller. So there is a big gravitational force pushing everything to, towards the interior. And for an excitation, of, an excitation with finite energy, cannot get all the way to the boundary because it's reflected by the gravitational potential. So the, the existence of this gravitational potential is uh, perhaps the most important feature of ADS and uh, the most important feature that governs many of the, uh, physic, of the physical properties of uh, ADS space. Now when uh, we discuss high energy scattering in QCD, we can discuss uh, several regimes. Uh, so we can have situations where we have uh, hard exclusive scattering. So we have, uh, let's say, two particles that collide at very high energies. And uh, we fix the initial and final states. And we take the energies of all the states uh, in question to be very large, keeping the angles fixed, or S over T fixed. Or we could do other things, like taking uh, the same collision, large S, but fixed T, or many other regimes uh, I will not discuss. So I will mostly concentrate on this type of regime. Um, now in QCD, high energy processes are calculable in terms of perturbation theory, as we saw in Ellis's uh, lectures. And so the type of questions we would like to understand in this talk uh, are slightly different. So first of all, uh, what's the role of the string that we saw in string theory? And how do we go from the picture in terms of strings to the picture that connects to perturbation theory? Um, now another question we could ask is, um, suppose that the new physics uh, we would discover in the LHC, or we would, uh, we would probably have in the LHC, let's say it's a, um, it's a conformal or almost conformal field theory um, above some confinement scale that would be the electroweak uh, scale. So we have something like a technicolor theory or a Randall syndrome model. And above that scale, uh, we have a new field theory that could be a, a conformal field theory, but with, let's say, strong coupling. Um, and so how would we do calculations uh, in that theory? In particular, if uh, that theory had an ADS dual, then uh, what would be the physics and how do we compute various uh, observables uh, in terms of the ADS dual. In particular, uh, some observables that are interesting and are relevant for colliders are uh, just jet cross sections. And so can we calculate them uh, using ADS? And so here, uh, of course, if we want to use ADS, we are talking about a theory that has a gravity dual. Um, and especially if we're going to use the gravity approximation to compute things. Um, so we want a theory that has a gravity dual. So that's not exactly QCD, uh, but it could be uh, a theory of new physics that we'll discover. Or uh, you can view it as an academic question of understanding how to uh, describe uh, this cross-section in such theories. Um, and it could eventually illuminate uh, some aspects of, uh, of QCD uh, because it lets you compute certain things at strong coupling. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking mostly about this paper we wrote recently, but I will also mention uh, some things that were done before by Paul Chinsky and Strassler. And there have been many other papers, but if you're going to start, uh, perhaps you can start with this paper, which uh, discusses one of the simplest examples, and then go on and look in the literature. Now, before I start discussing any, uh, any of these applications or scattering ideas, Let's uh, discuss uh, high energy string scattering in flat space. So since, uh, since we are having strings in ideas and we like to understand the scattering of strings in ideas, let's first understand the scattering of strings in flat space. So we consider two string states and they're going fixed angle, large energy, exclusive scattering. So we start with the two string states, they scatter by fixed angle, and we end up with the same two string states. Now, this is not necessarily the dominant process. So the dominant process might be one in which you collide, you form a highly excited string state that then uh, decays in also excited string states. So that's uh, another process you could consider. But you restrict to consider, you restrict to the process 
where you scatter, you take the two initial states and you end up with the same two initial states but at different angles. So uh, we'll also assume that the string coupling is sufficiently weak. I'll specify that in a second. And in this regime, the scattering is dominated by a single uh, classical string solution. And this single classical string solution is analogous to a tunneling solution because we, as I just mentioned, we are computing uh, something that is not really the dominant process, it's a subleading process. And so, the, um, as usual, when we are computing subleading things, uh, we, can have, uh, we can have them described by, in terms of a tunneling solution, in terms of a classical solution. So, all this was understood several years ago by uh, Gross and Mende. And they found the uh, classical string solution. So you take the initial particles, the initial strings, they go into two other strings at, uh, with different angles, and uh, you can find the solution explicitly. You can calculate the amplitude. So the amplitude is given in terms of the action or the area in space-time spanned by the solution. And you find that it goes like the square of the energy or the, um, or the center of mass energy times some function of the angle, which is uh, fairly simple, but I didn't want to write it. Um, so it's the energy, the square of the energy in string units. And this just comes from the area of this world sheet. Um, and this is uh, uh, somehow, this solution somehow lives in some complexified space, but the world sheet is space-like, and because it is space-like, the area is just e to the i s uh, ends up being a real number, and that's why you have a real number here. So you see that uh, for large energies, th this function is positive, so um, this is exponentially suppressed, as we said it would be. Um, so this is the right picture if the energy is much bigger than the string scale and much smaller than the string scale times uh, log of the string coupling. And so this bound comes from demanding that um, this, uh, this diagram, which is a three-level diagram, is less important, it's more important than the next correction. So the, the next, uh, the diagram which, which has one more genus. Um, so now we go back to uh, the problem we were trying to analyze. Uh, so scattering, uh, scattering in the field theory. So one uh, question we could try to answer is the following. So consider uh, you are in the gauge theory and you want to compute uh, a gluon scattering amplitude in the Larsen theory. So in the Larsen theory, the dominant process will be a planar, will be given by planar diagrams. Um, and when you have planar diagrams, you can uh, write down your amplitude in terms of all the various orderings in which you can stick in the external gluons to the planar diagram. Um, and so there is a sum over the permutation of all the gluons and then for each ordering uh, you have a number to compute um, that uh, gives you the so-called color ordered amplitude uh, where you have ordered the colors of the gluons according to the appearance in the planar diagram. Um, so this is the object uh, we'd like to compute and we'll try to compute it using, uh, you try to compute that strong coupling in ADS. So, in particular, the object we are going to compute is this function, um, which has no, no explicit color indices. So, we are dealing with a conformal field theory, and these amplitudes are going to be infrared divergent. Um, and actually, this, this infrared divergences have an interesting structure, and I'll discuss the structure of infrared divergences later. I mean, that's the same structure of, very, it's very closely related to the infrared structure of inf um, of the structure of infrared divergences in QCD. Now there are infrared diversions, but we can define, it, define them by introducing an infrared regulator. Um, we'll use, for example, dimensional regularization. And these amplitudes, even though they are infrared diversions, they are building blocks for closely related infrared finite observables, which are called uh, jet observables, in which we don't focus on a on an amplitude involving a, a, spe a specific number of gluons, but we sum over various, um, various numbers of gluons in the final state. Um, in particular, in the case of n equal to 4 super young males, uh, people have been uh, computing these amplitudes in perturbation theory, and they observed an interesting iterative structure for the amplitudes, 
especially the so-called MHV amplitudes, which are a special class of amplitudes, which is slightly simpler than the rest. And for those amplitudes, uh, they, based on the uh, iterative structure they had at low orders, uh, these authors um, con conjectured a general form uh, for the amplitudes, which is based on saying that the amplitude is the tree-level amplitude times a function um, which, um, which depends on lambda. And this is a very simple function because uh, we have a function of <coughs> the kinematic invariant for the four-point amplitude would be just S and T. If we had an endpoint amplitude, there would be more uh, invariants here. But the whole dependence on the coupling would appear in, ter in terms of a function um, multiplying, uh, a function of purely lambda, multiplying this function of the kinematic invariance. So in order to find this function, for example, you could uh, go to small lambda and uh, calculate it at one loop. So this function that appears here is the same as the one loop scattering amplitude. So that's uh, their conjecture. And one of the motivations of what we, would, what we did was to uh, try to understand whether uh, you would get the same structure uh, at strong coupling, since uh, their conjecture certainly implied that, that we would have the same structure also at strong coupling. So before I continue, I'll just tell you what the final answer is. The final answer is that the scattering process is described by a classical string wall sheet in ADS, uh, where uh, the amplitude is just simply the area of that classical wall sheet, um, and all the, the dependence on the coupling will come through uh, a factor here, will be, which will be the radius of ADS, and in terms of when we write in terms of the formula we saw in the beginning, which is the square root of lambda. So up to square root of lambda, we have a function of purely the kinematic invariance. So this is a general formula valid for any number of, um, well, any number of uh, variables here, any number of gluons. Uh, here I wrote it for the four gluon piece. And this is a function that should be computed by computing the classical solutions, a certain classical solution that I will specify later. So um, there are, uh, we're going to do this by introducing an infrared regulator and we'll use uh, two infrared regulators. Uh, one, um, the first one will use it to motivate the, uh, the answer to motivate the prescription for doing the computation. And the second one, we'll use it to actually doing the calculation. So the first one is simpler for motivating the prescription, and the second is simpler for doing the calculation. So the first regulator will consist in putting a brain in the infrared region of the geometry. Um, and the second will consist in doing dimensional regularization. So the first regulator is to uh, take a D-brain in the bulk, so a D-brain that is in the interior, and uh, considering uh, taking the gluons to be uh, open strings that uh, stretch, let's say, be between two brains of this kind. Um, and then we take uh, these particles and we scatter them uh, with uh, fixed gauge theory energy. By fixed gauge theory energy, what I mean is uh, we write the metric of ADS we write the metric of ADS in this form, and the gauge theory energy is the energy that is conjugate to translations in X. Um, so we keep the momentum conjugate to X fixed uh, as we take the infrared regulator to infinity. So here, when C goes to infinity, there we are removing the infrared regulator. Um, so one thing we see is uh, due to this warp factor uh, that or redshift factor that we said is very important for the physics of ADS, we see that the proper momentum, so the momentum viewed by an observer who's sitting on this infrared brain, is very high. So as we remove the regulator, so P stays fixed, and C is going to infinity, so this momentum uh, becomes very large. Uh, that means that we have high energy scattering in the bulk, and uh, the solution will be given by, again, a classical string solution. So it's analogous to the situation we had in, um, to the situation we had in flat space, um, but now it's in ADS space. So instead of considering a classical string solution in flat space, we simply find a classical string solution in ADS space. Um, now it's convenient for, this is just purely 
for the moment a mathematical trick, uh, and it's convenient to, in order to do this, to introduce, uh, to do a certain operation called t-duality, um, which uh, consists in, um, in making a duality transformation of this field on the world sheet of the string, so that we have the two-dimensional world sheet of the string, and instead of working with the field X, we work with the field Y, defined in this way. Um, and so we also redefine the radial coordinate. And after we do that, we end up with a problem, which ends up being a problem, again, in ADS5 uh, space, um, but written in terms of these other coordinates. So R is just uh, 1 over C, but Y is a coordinate that is uh, sort of non-locally related on the world sheet to the original X coordinate. Um, so if you're familiar with t-duality, all we're doing is just doing a t-duality in X. Um, and, and we, here we are doing a t-duality even though uh, these coordinates in principle are non-compact, but we're doing this, um, we're doing this in the, at the level of the classical theory, so we're on, only interested in finding, let's say, the classical solution, and we can certainly do that, that duality is a legal operation in terms of the classical solution. We can define the classical solution either in terms of the field X or the field Y. So uh, some, the usefulness of this is that we get again an ADS space and now we can use the symmetries of a, this ADS space to find the actual solution. Um, and a string that carried momentum in the original uh, coordinates now will carry some winding in the Y direction. So uh, we'll have objects that uh, will be stretching in the Y direction by an amount which is proportional to the momentum. So Y in a sense is like momentum space, so this t-duality on the world sheet is, uh, you can view it as some kind of Fourier transform in target space. So the final prescription is that um, you start with your glue momenta, and this defines a sequence of light-like segments on the boundary at r equal to zero. Oh, okay, one thing I forgot to mention uh, is that uh, when we do the regulator we mentioned in the previous transparency, um, we the gluons will end up being at c equal to infinity, which uh, in these new coordinates it's uh, r equal to zero. So the boundary conditions for this world sheet are going to be imposed at r equal to zero. And r equal to zero is the boundary of this uh, new ADS space. So we end up with a sequence of uh, light-like segments, which uh, represent the, the moment of the gluons. And um, they are ordered according to the uh, color ordering of the planar diagram we're interested in computing. Um, and then we need to find a world sheet that ends on these uh, light-like segments. So it's a world sheet that is extended in the radial direction of ADS, uh, but ends on these light-like segments. So the calculation is formally uh, similar to the computation of light-like Wilson loops. So if you were computing Wilson loops in the original gauge theory, you would again, uh, using the ADS prescription, then you would also need to compute uh, this, um, you would also need to compute the surface. And in, in, indeed also people um, have recently computed directly Wilson loops in the gauge theory and found that uh, the answer for these Wilson loops actually uh, matches the scattering amplitudes, at least at one loop. Uh, so this is a connection that uh, is also being explored, the relationship between Wilson loops and scattering amplitudes. But anyway, here uh, we get just this picture directly from performing these t-dualities, um, and we have temporarily removed the infrared regulator. So we said that uh, we end at r equal to zero. So there are a couple of things uh, that we should say already at this point. The first is that the linear order answer is independent of the polarization of the gluons, so it's independent of whether uh, they have positive or negative helicity, or whether it's a gluon or a fermion or a scalar. Um, and the dependence on these uh, polarizations should depend, at the, should appear at the next order. And in particular, we get the same answer for MHB diagrams and non-MHB diagrams. Um, the overall dependence of the coupling is again through the string tension. Um, now, in order to find the explicit solutions, we need to analyze a bit the symmetries of the problem. And this classical problem we are discussing is invariant under 
the conformal symmetries of this ADS space or momentum space. And this is not a symmetry of the full theory because if you do these T dualities, you uh, generate the dilaton, which depends on the R direction, the radial direction. So this, uh, so the problem, the full problem, the full string theory is not invariant under this, under this symmetry. But if you ignore the dilaton, and you can certainly do it uh, when you consider the problem of finding the classical string solution, then the problem becomes invariant under this symmetry. Now this symmetry was also observed at uh, weak coupling in the planar limit. So people, uh, these, these authors, considered um, planar diagrams and um, they observed that uh, the integrals appearing in these uh, computations also had the symmetry of a kind of conformal symmetry in momentum space. So probably it's a symmetry of the full uh, planar theory and it must be uh, linked uh, to integrability though nobody has uh, found this uh, connection very explicitly uh, because from the point of view of the original coordinates this momentum space conformal symmetries are generated by non-local currents or this uh, integrability also is associated to the existence of new uh, conserved currents that are non-local on the world shell. Now, using the symmetries, we can uh, find the world shell describing the four gluon scattering amplitude. In order to do it, you just start from a simpler situation where you have two light-like lines in ADS space, and you find the uh, world shell that ends on uh, these two light-like lines. And this problem is all, it's almost completely fixed by conformal symmetry. So the uh, problem has a boost invariance. So that implies that whatever Walsh you have should depend on t squared minus x squared. And also has a scale invariance, so that means uh, that this quantity should be proportional to c squared. And then you have to do a little calculation to find these two. But um, in principle, the solution is completely determined by conformal invariance. And then if you take this solution, which is written in so-called Poincaré coordinates, and you apply conformal transformations, uh, or if you um, write the same solution in global coordinates, you find that instead of having just one cusp, in global coordinates it has actually four cusps. And so uh, by just performing conformal transformations of this solution, you can find uh, the uh, solution that is describing the four gluon scattering amplitude, uh, which is a solution that has four of these uh, light-like cusps. Um, so and it's uh, simpler to describe it uh, by viewing ADS uh, as given by this equation. So this equation is given ADS5 uh, in terms of these six coordinates. Um, and so this is a five-dimensional space. We impose these, two equation, these three equations and we get a two-dimensional world sheet and that's uh, the world sheet we are trying to find. Now that works very nicely and it's very simple to find the solution for four gluons. Finding the end gluon solution would require more work and has not been done yet. So you, can, you found the solution, now uh, you compute the area and the area is infinite. Um, and in order to determine, um, to determine this area, to, to regularize this, you uh, use a new regulator, which is dimensional regularization. Now people who did uh, perturbative calculations in the gauge theory they uh, did dimensional regularization by doing a dimensional reduction from 10 dimensional superior mills to 4 plus epsilon dimensions. And they take epsilon to be positive, and that's a theory which is uh, free in the infrared, so we are slightly above 4 dimensions, so the theory becomes free, and uh, we can certainly define uh, the gluon scattering amplitudes in that theory. Now we'll apply the same strategy uh, and we'll uh, think about a DP brain in 10 dimensions. So we'll, we'll have these brains uh, in 10 dimensions. So we'll keep the total dimension space fixed, which is 10. And then we'll consider a DP brain with P equal to 3 plus epsilon. So the world volume has 4 plus epsilon dimensions. And the low energy theory in the world volume of these brains is this uh, 4 plus epsilon dimensional super EM mills. And then we find the gravity dual by looking at the near horizon geometry of these brains. And uh, we find the geometry which has this form, where um, we have the world volume directions and then some function, uh, which is given by solving Laplace's equation in the transfer space. And we can find by matching 
the parameters of the deep brain with the gravitational solution, we find some constants which depend on p and epsilon directly, and uh, we can write it in terms of the gauge coupling in p plus epsilon dimensions. Now this procedure is perfectly well defined when epsilon is an integer, and so you can do it for, uh, let's say, d1 brain, d2 brain, d3 brain, d4 brain, d5 brain, etc. Uh, and here all we are doing is uh, analytically continuing these uh, expressions for general values of, of epsilon. Um, then, as usual in dimensional regularization, the coupling, uh, the coupling uh, is the four-dimensional coupling, which is dimensionless, times some quantity uh, that um, has a scale, which is the scale of uh, dimensional regularization. And then uh, we find that the answer will contain some diversion terms that I'm going to discuss in a second, and uh, contains a finite piece, uh, which is this very simple function of S over T. Um, so that's uh, the function that was appearing in the original ansatz that we discussed before. And in fact, for this particular calculation, uh, this form for the finite piece is determined by this conformal symmetry or momentum space uh, conformal symmetry plus the structure of these infrared divergences. I'm going to talk in a second about the structure of the infrared divergences, but I want to point out that this finite factor is completely is determined by the symmetries. And this should not be surprising uh, since uh, we determined the solution uh, by using some symmetries. We found the solutions by using symmetries. Now let me uh, talk a bit about these infrared divergences. Um, so the, uh, the infrared divergences in the planar theory um, come from soft gluons, so very low energy gluons that are exchanged between uh, the gluons that are undergoing scattering or the uh, gluons whose momentum we, kept, we keep fixed. And so we have uh, the divergences are given by a sum of factors uh, one per pizza slice of this diagram. So we have planar diagrams and we can separate them in uh, these various pizza slices. And we uh, have one factor per slice. So, and for each factor, we get a double pole in epsilon and a single pole in epsilon. So double poles in epsilon and single pole in, poles in epsilon are related to uh, divergences, uh, which are the square of a log or single log. I'll try to explain uh, in a second why it is really a square of a log, but for the moment, uh, believe me that this is, uh, uh, this is what happens in general in gauge theories, and this is what happens in this theory too. And this function that appears in front is a very uh, universal function that appears in many processes in uh, gauge theories. It's called the cusp anomalous dimension. Um, and well, it makes an appearance here um, uh, in, this, uh, in this calculation. And it also uh, appears when you consider the anomalous dimensions of high spin operators. Um, you, if you look at the leading twist operators, for example, you look at the operators for very large spin, you find that for very large spin, uh, the anomalous dimensions case like the log of spin with some prefactor which is the same as this function. So this is a function that appears uh, whenever you have a situation uh, where you have two fast moving gluons um, and which are exchanging soft gluons. Um. Now, uh, why, why, do, um, why do we have this double log? So I'll try to explain here why we have this double log. So one way to understand it is uh, the following. So you take uh, these gluons and um, they have uh, some fixed momentum and then they are exchanging lower energy gluons. So to the extent that uh, these gluons that are being exchanged uh, have low momentum, uh, we can replace uh, these uh, gluons by Wilson lines. So let's consider the infrared properties of such of a configuration like this uh, with two Wilson lines. Then uh, such a configuration is invariant under two non-compact symmetries. One is uh, boosts uh, in the, along the light -like direction, so these are light-like uh, light -like lines, so you can think of them as extending in x plus and x minus, so we can have boosts in the x plus x minus plane. And we also have scale transformations. Now, um, 
So um, if you have a symmetry that is invariant and there are two uh, non-compact directions, non-compact uh, symmetries, um, and for example, uh, an example of such a system would be a configuration, um, a system which has time translation invariance and space translation invariance. And if, uh, let's say, the two orthogonal directions are compact, uh, then such a system would have a, a partition function or, or an energy, uh, a partition function that um, is exponential in the total length of time and the total length of space. Now, in this case, uh, it is possible to make a bile transformation or a change of coordinates um, in such a way that these two transformations become just ordinary translations, ordinary explicit translations of the metric. And when you do that, also the other two orthogonal directions become effectively compact. And so that explains, and, and in that space, you have a flux, which is the color electric field that is going from one line to the other line. And uh, this flux is confined in, this, uh, in the transverse directions and uh, should have an energy density which scales, which is proportional to the volume or the length of the time and length of space. Anyway, so that's uh, an abstract argument that uh, tells you that this should, always be, um, this should always be proportional to this double log. Of course, uh, if you do calculations in perturbation theory, you also see this double log explicitly from looking at Feynman diagrams in various regimes. And that's how. Uh, it was uh, originally found. Um, but this double log is completely generic and is true in, in any uh, conformal field theory uh, which uh, has a gauge field in it. So it's valid in other dimensions and so on. Um, and F is then that, that constant energy density. Um, okay, I already said that. Now, of course, the interpretation of this double log, of these diversions, is that it suppresses the amplitude. So even though it's a diversion, it's exponentiated, and so it makes the amplitude very small, so f is positive. Um, and it makes the amplitude very small, and it's just saying that we have zero probability to emit no extra gluons. Uh, it's, uh, this is standard, it's also present in QED, so if those two lines were two lie-like electrons, uh, we'll also uh, get this double log. Um, of course, if the field theory is not, um, is not conformal, then in addition you'll have some running of the coupling, and here this will be replaced by an integral where you also integrate, and so on. Um, and these uh, divergences disappear when one considers the finite energy resolution of the detector, uh, where you don't detect very low energy gluons, and you also don't resolve, you allow uh, for multiple gluons in the final collinear gluons. So once you consider these two things, you will, uh, these divergences will disappear, but they will get replaced by explicit dependence on various cutoffs one puts in the detector. So these are uh, important quantities uh, to understand. Now diversions, besides having a double log, it also has a single log that is characterized by a second function g. Um, and the precise definition of this function depends on precisely how you are cutting off your divergences. So if you redefine mu to mu times uh, kappa, then you will shift this function g by, some, uh, by the function f. But once you define your infrared regulator, you can compute the function g. And if you are interested in doing a, a concrete calculation, you will have to compute your function g. So people who uh, do concrete calculations, they have to compute the function f and the function g uh, in order to compute something physical. Um, now, for the case of n equal to 4 super young males, this function g was computed at three loops uh, at weak coupling in this paper, and recently there's been also another paper where it was computed numerically at four loops. Um, it also, at least up to three loops, it obeys a so-called maximal transcendentality principle, which is uh, simply some interesting fit form of the perturbative series, that the coefficients involve zeta functions of degree correlated to the loop. So it has some interesting number theoretic properties, let's say. Um, and in this case, we can compute that strong coupling using the solution I uh, just discussed, and we find some expression for the strong coupling answer. So we, we, we find the strong coupling answer for this function g. Um, and of course, in order to do this comparison, we need to define the d-dimensional coupling, or we need to define the infrared regulator in the same, in the same way that these authors defined it. 
Otherwise, the, meaning, the comparison is meaningless. But we understand the calculation well enough to be able to uh, say that we're doing the calculation in the same conventions. So uh, they are answered. So this was the form of our answer. And well, our answer had this form, but with the squirt of lambda here. Um, this is the general form of the answer. Um, and uh, so their answer agrees with the answer we found at strong coupling once you use the, uh, the strong coupling form for the function f, which is, as remind you, the cusp anomalous dimension. Um, now, in this case, uh, the, uh, this finite piece is determined by, by symmetries, though they are subtle symmetries. This is not the conformal symmetries of the original theory, but it's this momentum space conformal symmetry that um, needs to be understood better. For n gluons, uh, this author proposed also an explicit form, uh, but more complicated, and that has not been checked directly at strong coupling. So you will have to do a string calculation on strong coupling to check that. I'm just going to flash what the answer they got is, so it's some function. Uh, you don't need to look at the details, only you know that there exists some function. Now I'm going to discuss uh, another calculation. Uh, this, is, uh, this is basically this paper by Polchinski and Strassler. Um, this is a slightly different calculation, uh, where again we scatter two uh, objects at high energies and fixed angles. And the calculation is somewhat similar to what I discussed, uh, but some details are different. Um, OK, so here uh, the idea is uh, similar to what I discussed, except that instead of sc scattering gluons, we scatter two physical objects. So these are two, um, two glue balls, for example, or two mesons uh, in a confining theory. So we're imagining a theory that uh, is confining. Um, so it has some object here which cuts off uh, the ADS direction. Um, and above the confinement scale, it's a strongly coupled theory that has an ADS dual. Uh, so it's, it's not like QCD, which uh, would have uh, we will have an ADS dual, but almost ADS dual, but with very small radius of curvature. Here, let's imagine that the radius of curvature is large enough so that we can uh, use the gravity computations. And we compute again exclusive two to two scattering. So we take um, the um, these two objects and we just simply scatter them. Um, now. If we were very naive, uh, we would say that this is uh, similar to scattering uh, closed strings in the bulk. So the same calculation we discussed of scattering closed strings in flat space. And that would give you an answer which would be exponentially decreasing. So it would be an exponentially decreasing function of the energy. Um, and this was indeed, uh, well, OK, so that's uh, the naive answer. Uh, on the other hand, if you use a parton picture, you find that uh, in, with the parton picture, it would go like 1 over the, so that you are scattering here some uh, hard uh, gluons and so on. And the answer would go like uh, 1 over the energy to uh, the number of partons, essentially. And well, of course, uh, in experiment, they, be, they behave more in this way. And this was one of the arguments for saying that uh, string theory could not be a good description of QCD. Uh, because it predicted the wrong amplitudes. Now, in fact, uh, this, this, the solution of this problem, uh, uh, so this problem is solved when uh, you take into account uh, the, the warp factor and uh, when you take into account properly the physics of the warp factor. Uh, and the fact that uh, these gluons um, these, sorry, these uh, mesons or uh, glue balls that are here in the infrared uh, have a wave function which decays exponentially when you go off in the C direction. OK, so at first you would be tempted to say, well, if the wave function decreases exponentially, I mean, this exponential decrease of the wave function is due to the uh, exponential increase, sorry, it's due to the increase of the gravitational fact, um, potential that pushes the particle towards the infrared. So uh, here, this uh, particle is in the so-called, well, it's in the forbidden region, so it decays exponentially. The wave function decays exponentially. OK, so um, now 
Here is an example where we see that we have to be very careful when we are computing a very small quantity. So we found that if we computed the scattering of strings at this position, then we naively would get something which goes like e to the minus energy squared. Um, however, if uh, for some reason the particle moves up uh, in the uh, along the gravitational potential or moves closer to the boundary, uh, then you pay some price because the wave function there is very small, so there's a small probability that the particle will be in this region. However, you gain something because the amplitude, the string scattering amplitude, will be less suppressed because the, the factor that appears here is the proper energy in the, in the center of mass scattering. Um, so that would be the proper energy that an observer sees at the position C where the scattering is occurring. And that proper energy is related to the gauge theory energy through this formula. This is the same formula we discussed before. Um, and so then you have this exponential, um, this exponential factor. And the value of C where the scattering will proceed will be such that, um, that this whole expression is maximized. So you see when you go to very small C that is very close to the boundary, this factor becomes small. Um, but also this, exp this whole exponential becomes larger. On the other hand, when you go to very large values of C, you pay a huge price due to this exponential, uh, but not so much, well, but you gain from this factor. So in the end, uh, you can find the, the value of C by uh, simply the saddle point, and you find that C goes like one over E. Um, re remember uh, that there is this relationship that I mentioned in the first transparency between the size of an object in the gauge theory and the position in the C direction. And this is, in this is more or less related to that. So here, when we have a scattering at gauge theory energy E, we're exploring uh, the theory at, um, at sizes of order one over E. And so we expect that the dominant contribution should come from a value of C of order one over E. So this uh, calculation is also in agreement with that general picture. Um, and so after you do that, you um, find that essentially uh, the amplitude, uh, so since C times E, is, this will be a further one, it's dominated by this factor, and so we get an amplitude that uh, goes like E to the four times the conformal dimension. And the conformal dimension that appears here um, is the conformal dimension of the lowest operator that can create uh, the pion or the gluon or whatever particle uh, we have in the bulk. So one nice feature of this calculation is that, um, in some sense, th the reason uh, that strings couldn't describe scattering in the gauge theory is actually the reason they can describe it once you include the war factor. So you're, you're using what, uh, the objection in order to overcome it, in some sense. Um, so in conclusion, we discussed uh, some prescriptions for computing gluon scattering amplitudes and we check that, uh, that uh, ansatz um, that people have made for n equal to four super young mills. Um, we observed the presence of uh, momentum space conformal symmetry, and we computed these functions uh, that determine the logarithmic divergences uh, in, uh, at strong coupling. Um, and in principle, the prescription should also work for n gluons. And also, one can generalize it uh, to compute the computation of form factors. Um, and we also discussed the infrared structure of the amplitudes. Now, of course, uh, one would like to compute the amplitude for n gluons and check these ansatz for n gluons. And one question uh, one can ask is whether one can compute this function f uh, using integrability. Well, I didn't mention this, but this function f of lambda uh, was computed exactly uh, using integrability by uh, by Sertiden and Staudacher. Um, well, or at least it was uh, given as the solution of an integral equation, which you would then solve numerically. But this function is essentially computed exactly, and the question is whether you can also compute this one exactly. Um, and one interesting question to understand is to understand the crossover uh, from weak to strong coupling in the jet physics of n equal to four super young mills, in order to perhaps learn something about QCD. Well, thank you very much. Yep. Um, I don't understand why the far gluon amplitude doesn't depend on the universal scaling function f. Because if you 
becomes a general uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it does depend on that function f. Uh, let me see. Are you asking about this? Yeah. Yeah. So the the answer we got um, had a square root of lambda. So it had the strong coupling form of the function f, because we did the calculation at strong coupling, or in other words, we did it a leader, leading order in the alpha prime expansion in string theory. So we just get the form of the function f at that order. Yeah. Uh, this one here? Yeah, here I'm only, uh, I'm only looking at the dependence on the energy, right? Um, and I'm, considering, I'm not considering objects that are colored. These are color neutral objects. So this whole story that I, I gave before for the infrared divergences um, is a story that is valid when you consider the scattering of colored objects, right? Here, this is, we were in the confined theory, and we are doing a correct, physically uh, interesting scattering. So this is a physical observable that does not have any dependence on the infrared regulator. Right? It's, it's just infrared finite, and it has this dependence. And uh, Um, you're talking about the function f of lambda? Yeah, so that function is understood at all values of the coupling. We certainly know it at all values. Of, well, we know it as the solution of an integral equation at all values of the coupling. Yeah. Yeah, Nim. So, so, um, so it, it was important that, uh, that you have this color, that you have this color or an amplitude, so right. that there, there, was a, there was a uncolored object that, that meant. Right. Yeah. Um, if you're not a part of that, is, is there some, so, so there's many, there's, there's, there's a number of those, of those uh, right. the, you know, there's a number of color and so on. Is there an interpretation for the rest of them in terms of being associated with uh, something to do with light particles and lines? Um, the most sort of one is sort of clearly associated with that. But is there some other way of decorating those and lines? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, when you want this uh, color under amplitude, if it's a glow amplitude, so it's not getting mine, right? On the other side, you want to do with some uh, line, uh, with some loop, which is made in mine. Yeah. Is there any. Um, okay. Well, I mean, uh, to, um, let's see. So once we define the color ordered amplitude, uh, the color ordered amplitude is gauge invariant, right? We, we extracted the color factor. So now we are, dealing, we are dealing with a function that has no gauge indices, right? We extracted out the gauge indices. So the object we are dealing with is gauge invariant. So it's not surprising that uh, the, you replace them by Wilson lines, which are also gauge invariant. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, pre pre presumably you could also do that. So you uh, you would just have to understand what are the momenta of the extra lines, yeah. whether they are large or not. Yeah. Yeah, but you would like to understand how that is reflected in ideas and how to overcome the objection. Uh, we, should, we should be very happy that we found it to work. Yes. We wouldn't be very surprised if it didn't work. Because here we know it's the field. We feel we get this answer. Yeah, yeah. 
No, you're, you're right. I mean, to the extent that ADS it gives you the physics of a field theory, uh, it should reproduce the field theory. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it was unclear in the beginning how it could do that. So I think, uh, so that paper showed how it could uh, certainly agree with the field theory and what was the necessary physics you need to input to make it agree with the expectation in the field theory. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very closely connected. So uh, um, we had this formula in the conformal theory. So in, in QCD, you would have essentially a similar formula, except that lambda now depends on the scale, right? Now, what scale you should put here? Well, you should put here essentially some scale related to mu. Let's say it's some scale mu prime, and you'll have to integrate here, essentially from mu over mu prime uh, up to scale mu. So that, that's roughly what you need to do. So you, you integrate essentially from s to mu to infinity, right? The scale mu prime. And then here you'll have a function lambda of mu prime, and then you have a single log. And then you'll get, uh, well, you don't get exactly double log, but you get a similar expression. So you don't get a double log, you just no. get a single log. No, in QCD, well, Morally, it's a double log, right? Because it's the integral of a single log, OK? Except that the function appearing in front also has a dependence on, on mu. So uh, if you take into account this extra dependence on mu, then the function will not be exactly a log. But morally, that's what it is. So this is, yeah. I mean, this is a function that's been computed in QCD and so on. So it's, 